And, uh, and you may have heard this poem before. Uh, yesterday, our family did our traditional watching of the movie Elf, which is one of the most cringy movies there is, but, um, but fun. All right, so I'm going to read you a poem, and, uh, and this, was, this, this was in this movie, so you ready? Does everybody have some Christmas cheer? Are we excited? All right. You better watch out. You better not cry. You better not pout, and I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. Are you with me so far? Have you heard this song before? All right. Donna, you're so awesome. All right. He's making a list. He's checking it twice. He's going to find out who's naughty or nice. Santa Claus is coming to town. That, that's how we're at so far. All right. Now we got one more night. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows if you've been bad or good. So be good, for goodness sake. Oh, you better watch out. And you better not cry. You better not pout. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. And that's the poem. And I don't know about you, but that gets really creepy at the end of that song. Thank you for the accompaniment, Donna. That is like the creepiest song. I don't know. Like, it starts off so nice. And I was thinking about this song as we were listening and watching this movie. Who wrote this song? That's what I want to know. I, I have this feeling that this song was written by someone with terrible children. <laughs> like, how else? I mean, let's just take an honesty check, parents in the room. How many of you in the last two weeks have threatened to take a present back? Just be honest. Come on. Let's go. There you go. See? This song had to have been written by someone who had the worst kids. And I was, I was thinking about, like... This, this dad who was just trying so hard, like, don't talk back to your mom. Stop hitting your brother. Stop arguing. And, and just this exasperation. Listen to me when I'm talking to you. Quit throwing tantrums, like the things that we say as parents. But the worst part of all is bedtime. It is the devil's hour. And I can just imagine that there's this poor guy who is exasperated this time of year at his children, and they tell the kids, mom and dad say, go to bed, the kids keep getting up. This may not happen in your house, but the kids keep getting up, and I can imagine the exasperation of the parents. They've hit pause on their TV show 17 times now. And finally, the kid comes downstairs one more time and says, daddy, you tell me a bedtime story, or will you sing me a song? And the dad says, hmm, sure, I got an idea. <laughs> Goes like this, you better watch out. <laughs> and you better not cry. And I think that the happy music was added later. That's my theory on the song, because if you just look at the lyrics themselves, they are quite terrifying. I, I, I mean, just who's going to write a song like he sees you when you're sleeping? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> Don't get up. <laughs> Something like that. And I, I just imagine this poor dad just like tucking their kid in, you know, Santa Claus is coming to town, and then just sleep tight, good night, after the song. And then, and then walking downstairs with this big grin on his face saying, now that'll take care of it. <laughs> now we're good. Now we're, we're sealed. And, and you know... Yeah, Santa isn't going to fix the problem for this dad. I think there might be bigger problems at play, right? I think that there's bigger issues. You know, Santa's not going to bring you presents. My, my kids and my wife and I, we have this joke with each other. Our kids have never received a present for Santa, and it's not for religious reasons. It's just not fair that he would get the credit for something I had to spend all that money on. <laughs> right? So they're always from us. So we want to be properly thanked. Just saying. We can't count on Santa to fix our problems. But at the core of humanity, we're all looking for something to take care of something for us, for someone to step in and to save us and rescue us and to take care of us and to fix it all. We're looking for more. We want something greater or something more meaningful. And, and we, we want something that is going to fill a void and give us meaning. Every single one of us wants meaning in this life. We want to matter. We want someone to notice us. 
We, we're always looking for something greater and something better. And so what we do is we fill that need with whatever we can get our hands on. We fill our need with whatever we can find. And in our culture, the answer is chasing after more stuff. Now, I saw a, uh, I was watching the news the other night, which I don't do very often, but they were talking about Boxing Day, and it looks more terrifying than Black Friday. You should just like watch, look up some videos of Boxing Day. It's like this shopping day. I don't even know what country celebrates that. Does anyone even know? Canada. Canada. There you go. I think that's a more appropriate name for a day where there's hectic chaos in a store, Boxing Day. I don't know if that probably didn't start that way, but anyway, we want stuff. That's where we're at. And we need the newest toys and bigger TVs. We need the latest gadgets. And, and we, we have all these things that we, we have our needs need to be met. And we try to numb our pain. We, we have, a, as a society, we turn to drugs and alcohol. We turn to throwing away this relationship for a better relationship. And we do all of these things. We, and we, we convince ourselves and we tell ourselves, once I attain this, I'll be okay. Once I finally get this, I will be fine. You know, and and we, we tell ourselves these things as if it's going to fix all of our problems. And, and we get tired of the broken down car. And so we say, once I own a car that is 2014 and newer, then all of my problems will go away. And then we find out that it doesn't because there was a payment that went with that car. And then we create a new problem. So we're always trying to come up with something new. I am a Black Friday shopper, and I am amazed every single year the sheer quantity of massive televisions. Now, I'm not judging you if you have a massive television. That's fine. But the massive quantity of massive, of huge televisions that go out the doors nonstop on Black Friday. And I think, my goodness, America, how do you not have TVs already? <laughs> right? Well, it's not that. It's just now it's 4K, ultra, whatever, bigger size, thinner, faster. I, I don't really know, right? Like, it's just, it is, it is what it is. And, and that's fine. But it's, we're always trying to get the next level up. We're always trying to get to this better thing. And we want more. And then sometimes if we choose things that are more and they're not maybe the best choices, then we start feeling guilty about our choice because we feel bad. Well, why am I so unsatisfied? Or why am I materialistic? Or, or why am I so shallow? And we think of these things. And maybe you don't think of them. People just tell you you're shallow and then you feel bad. Something like that. How, whatever happens to be your case. But we get to these places and we just feel bad. It, we either feel bad or we justify our actions. And we say things in our society. One of my least favorite sayings in our society is, I'm just following my heart. Just following my heart. Okay, hearts lead to all kinds of Terrible decisions. Right, we, just, we, we are called to follow something greater. We're called to follow a higher standard. But because our heart will chase the wrong things. And what happens when we discover that after we attain all of these things, when we finally got that new relationship and that new TV and that new phone and that whatever it happens to be, the new house, the new car, all the things... What happens when we discover we have all those things, but then there's still something here that says, I still need more. I still want more. And I'm telling you, that will never go away because the need for more is something that God put in every human heart. That God put that within us. There is something in us that God has placed in us upon creation that there is a desire in us to want something more, something greater, or something better. It's a beck and call to search for Him to seek something greater than ourselves, to find a Savior. And it's been this way for all of history. This isn't a new thing. If you think that you're, the world now is, getting, is worse and worse and worse and worse than it's ever been, read some of the Old Testament and you'll find that there were things happening there that were way worse than what are happening now. It's been this way throughout all of humanity, trying to fill a void so that we can feel like something is saving us, something is taking care of us, is meeting our needs. There's a need for more. And it's been that way through all of history because God created us that way to search for Him. I want to tell you about a man named John. And uh, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 3 this morning. If you have a Bible or if you have the YouVersion app, you can turn to Luke chapter 3. And I want to tell you about a man named John. You may know him from his stage name, John the Baptist, where he was out and, and baptizing people. They'd come to him and he would say, you need to repent, you need to turn from your ways. And he was sent by God really as a herald 
which is a good Christmas word, to declare the coming of Jesus. And so people came to him and he baptized them in water as a symbol of their confession of sin. So they came to him and he said, listen, you are messed up, humanity. And they said, what should we do? And he said, turn from your wicked ways and turn to God. And then he would baptize them in water as they confessed their need for God. And the people of this time recognized that John was sent from God. And so they came to him and they said, we need some help. John. We need some advice. We need some good counsel. They recognized there was something different about him. There was a more in John that they were missing, and they asked him for help and advice in this time. And so he was declaring out, you need more. You need to step it up. You need to be better. We can be better than this. And, and they began to turn from their ways, but they needed to know how. They didn't understand. And so he gave them advice. We'll start with Luke chapter 3, verse 10. He gives them advice, and it said, they said, What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, Don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Now, this is good life coach stuff. It's pretty basic. Most of you could probably give the same advice. In fact, these are all things that you should have learned in kindergarten by now. This is not hard stuff. He's, he's telling them, share, be fair, and don't scare. That's it. That's all you got to do. Just be nice. It, it's, it doesn't seem to be that difficult when someone comes to you who's extorting money from other people. Well, what should I do? Stop extorting money from people. Like, this isn't really challenging stuff, but they were so messed up and they had such a hole in their lives and they were so needing someone to tell them what to do because they were that messed up. They said, we need to turn to someone else. And they were so desperate, they hung on his every word. I mean, they, everything he said, it was like, oh my goodness, that's amazing. Have you ever given someone advice that you think this is the most common sense in the whole world? And they're like, oh, I never thought. And you wonder in your head, but you might not say it out loud, how is that possible? <laughs> but this was the case here. They, they hadn't thought of this stuff, and they, they hung on his every word. He was their big screen TV. He was their new relationship. He was the one who was filling a void in their lives with his words. It says in Luke chapter 3, next verse 15, it says that the people were waiting expectantly and we're all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. Now, you've got to know in this time that, that as Matt was reading this prophecy, it was a prophecy from the Old Testament that foretold the people that Jesus Christ was coming, the Messiah was coming. And so when John showed up and he had amazing, amazing supernatural wisdom, or what I would just call common sense, they thought, he's got to be the one. And they wondered, and they, were, they had an expectation in their hearts that he was it. Is he going to save us? Is this the one who's going to come and overthrow evil in the world? Like, they, they were really wondering this, which here's the thing. Like, I don't know how they possibly wondered this. Have you ever read the description of John? He lived in the wilderness, wore camel's hair, and ate locusts, grasshoppers, and honey. And they thought, this is it. Let's elect this guy president, right? Oh, I probably shouldn't have said that. That, that. I wasn't, uh, yeah, that wasn't a political statement. I was just saying, some of you were trying to draw too close of a similarity there, and that's not where I was going, just saying that. <laughs> All right, moving right on along. This guy's out there, and yet let's look to him to be our savior. Let's look that he is the one in charge. Will he make all my wrongs right? Will he bring me hope I can't seem to find? Maybe he's what I have been missing. But John knew something that they didn't know, and he knew that he wasn't their answer. He knew that he wasn't going to be the one that could save them. He knew that he wasn't the more. He knew that he had something that God was sharing with him that he needed to declare to the people, and that was, was that there was someone else coming. And so John, in the next verse, he, he stops them, and they, as they ask the questions, and he begins to sing a song to them that went, you better watch out, you better not cry, you better not pout, I'm telling you why, Jesus Christ is coming to town. Well, it didn't sound exactly like that, 
But it was the gist of the idea. In fact, it actually, I'll read the, the literal version here. It says, John answered them, verse 16, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. You see, John declared out to the people, listen, I understand that there's a void in your life, but the more that you're looking for is Jesus. The more that you feel like is, is missing, the thing that that void in your heart, that place that God put in you, that, that you are trying to fill with whatever wisdom or whatever thing you can find, it's Jesus. I'm just a temporary work. I'm just a temporary thing. I'm only baptizing you to prepare you for the more that God has for you. And his work wasn't to be the Savior. His work was to point people to the Savior. But, but we do this still to this day as we go to temporary saviors to try to save us from things. We go to temporary saviors to try to help us feel better. And the difference between John the Baptist and the saviors we turn to is those temporary saviors, they don't try to point you to Jesus like John did. They simply don't point you to Jesus. Addiction doesn't try to get you to stop and go find Jesus. YouTube doesn't flash a warning after an hour. Read your Bible. It just doesn't do it. It should do it, but it doesn't do it. You don't rediscover the love of God in the midst of a marital affair. It's just these things don't happen. Temporary saviors don't point you to the real Savior. But John did. John pointed them to the real Savior. He knew that Jesus was the more. He knew that he wasn't just more. He was way more. He said he is so much more powerful than I am that I'm not even worthy to do the most basic thing like untie his shoes. That's how much more Jesus is. I can't even come close to his greatness. See, the things that we use for temporary relief, they can't come close either. They can't give the hope that Jesus gives. They can't bring the peace that he has. They can't compare to the power of the Son of God who stepped into this world for you. I want you to know this morning that the Son of God stepped into this world for you. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, it says, For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. For the entire fullness of God. God knows your heart. He knows humanity. He knows you, and He knows what you need. And He sent His Son, the fullness of God, to step into this world, born as a baby, born as one of us, so that He could come and live a sinless life and lay his life down for you. When you examine your life, you'll find, if you look hard enough, if you need help, ask a friend, there are things in your life that don't measure up to God's standard. They don't measure up. There's no one perfect here in this place. But thanks be to God who sent his son to dwell in bodily form to be perfect for you. To make a way back to God, to open up the door that so humanity could find the more that they had been searching for for centuries. And our world is still searching for more. Our world is still looking for that more. And John would say to the people that day, and I believe if he was here, he'd say it again. Jesus is the more. Jesus is the more. All of God was going to step into the scene in Jesus. All of God was stepped into the world in Jesus. All of His power stepped into this world. All of His redemption, all of His saving, all of His joy, it all stepped into the world. All of His peace, it all came. All of His mercy and His grace, it all stepped into the world for you and for me. Friends, that thing you're searching for is found in Jesus. And, and some of you today might say, you know, I, I know this. I know that Jesus is the more. In fact, I, I've been walking with Jesus. I have accepted Jesus many years ago. I get it. But listen, there are things in your life as they come up. I want to ask you today, is Jesus the more? Is he what we're leaning upon? Is he? Are, we, we medicate ourselves in, in the places we, we look for quick fixes. But Jesus is the only one who can satisfy. And I just believe that there's 
some people here today who need to hear this. Jesus has more for you. You may have come in here this morning in your, your current situation, and you might say to me, you, you don't get it. You don't know the situation I'm in. You don't know what I'm going through right now. And you're right, I probably don't. But I know someone who does. His name is Jesus. And he is more than enough to walk you through this situation and this season in life. You might have things in your life and you're trying to fill those voids. You're trying to, to do everything you can to just be okay. I get it. We've all gone through seasons in our own ways. We've all gone through places in our own life. And it's different for everyone. But we've all gone through places where we feel like we're drowning in a season. Or we feel like we can't breathe in a season. Or we feel like our heart is hurt so badly that we wonder how it's even pumping blood through our bodies. And we have these seasons of our life and we have these places in our life. And in those places, we can choose to turn to the one who came into this world to give us all of it, the more, or we can look in other places. Here in our story today, they were so desperate for something, they looked in other places. And fortunately for them, John pointed them back to Jesus. He wasn't a temporary Savior that just said, yeah, keep coming to me. In fact, we know from John's life that when he, he had disciples too. And we know that when Jesus came on the scene and they wanted to leave John and they wanted to go follow Jesus instead, he was like, bye-bye. Yeah, that's the guy you need to follow. He's the real Savior. And I'm here to tell you today that no matter where you're at today, maybe you're in a season of your life where you say, you know, it hasn't been good up till now. Or this last year has been a rough one for me. I just don't know if I can take it anymore, but I just believe that God will want you to know this morning He has more for you. He has more for you in, in your future ahead. That, that regardless of where you've been, He sees you where you're at today, and He says, let me be your joy, let me be your peace, let me be your Savior, because I have more for you. That life that you, you now think, I'll never live it. I'll never, will I ever be happy? Will I ever be content? Will I ever have my dreams fulfilled? I believe that God would say to you today, put your hope and trust in me and watch what I will do. He has more for you. He has more for your future than you could ever imagine. He doesn't stop dreaming and He doesn't stop having vision when we do. He doesn't get discouraged over what could possibly happen, or he doesn't get discouraged about obstacles and circumstances like we do. He doesn't get intimidated when things look like the odds are all against us. See, with God, odds don't matter. Odds don't matter at all, because God can override it all. In fact, he overrode the depravity of mankind and said, watch this, I'm going to send my son into this world to rescue it. And so he saves us. And I believe that Jesus has more for you than you can ever expect. More than you can hope for. There's more than enough of Jesus to fill the heartache. There's enough to give you clarity in a season where you just feel like I just everything is so fuzzy in this time. I just feel like I can't get any clarity. He is the bringer of vision and clarity. He's the cure. He's the fix. He's the solution. I want you to know this morning that Jesus Christ is coming to town. As we celebrate Christmas, that's what it's about. It's, a, it, it's about the fact that Jesus came to town. A little town of Bethlehem. A nowhere place. Somewhere where no one is paying attention, where no one's going to notice. In fact, when Jesus in his ministry, he, he, was, he was raised in a place called Nazareth, and, and they said, can anything good come from Nazareth? He, he came to a place that no one would care about and no one would notice. That's the, that's the place he resided. And if you're in a place this morning and say, well, what about me? No one cares about me. No one notices me. He wants to come to your town. He wants to come to your life. He wants to, to enter into a place and it it's doesn't have to be a big show. But I want you to know that the place in which Jesus arrived into this world was a nowhere nobody place and if you feel like you are a nowhere nobody person he wants to arrive in that place with you and he wants to light up your world and he wants to shine upon it and bring you hope again 
that he would come to your town, that he would come to your life. And all you got to do is invite him in. If you invite him and say, will you come and fill this house, this place, with the more that you have? Jesus, would you come and fill this need in my heart that I just can't seem to get past? Would you come to me and would you fill that more that God has put in every single one of us? Would you close your eyes with me? I would like to pray over you this morning. God, you are good. We thank you, Lord. Friends, this morning in this place, I would just ask you, if you were in that place where you're saying, you know, I, I recognize my need for more. And if you're in a place where you have never received Jesus into your life, where you've never said, I, I need him to come to my town, I need him to fill this need for more, and I just need to receive what he has for me right now in this season of my life. If you're in that place today with, with everybody's just got their eyes closed, would you just raise your hand for just a moment? Or even just look up at me for a second, and I just want to pray for you today. Thank you, God. Thank you, anyone else? Put your hands down. If there's anyone that this morning you just feel like, you know, I've got this circumstance, I've got this season of life, I've got this place where I desperately need more. And the things that I've been trying to fill that more with, they aren't working. And I need Jesus to come again today like it's the first time all over again that he would come and fill this. And give me hope again and give me vision again and give me clarity again. That he would give me love again. If you're in a place today where you say, I just need Jesus to come and be that more for me right now in this place, you just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. God, thank you, God. You can put your hands down. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray together. Lord, we thank you. Church, would you just say this simple prayer with me? Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I need you to be my more. I put down my old life and I pick up life that you have for me. I turn away from filling my heart with other things. Fill my life with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing this chorus with me this morning? If you would like prayer today.